Now our podcast is going to taste like cherry cheesecake. (laughs) (laughs) Hello and welcome to Podkeep Our Land. It's what? Ed Schreier. Would have listened to. We are a show about politics, politicians, parliaments, and policy. My name is Aaron Rennie. I'm Matthew Naylor. <laughs> and I'm Patrick Meehan. It's April 9th, 2018, and we are podcasting to you from East Vancouver. Um, we've got a great show on for you tonight. Uh, we'll be starting off with a few um, news updates, talking about the Chilcotin exoneration of the, um, of the Chilcotin chiefs. Uh, we'll be talking about the new lieutenant governors in BC and Newfoundland. Talk a little bit about uh, Bloc Québécois politics and their leadership referendum. We'll then be going to Ottawa and discussing the um, the marijuana bill and uh, the, the recent Senate vote on that. And then finally, we'll be talking about energy politics and uh, discussing the LNG tax breaks that uh, Premier Horgan recently announced, as well as the ongoing battle uh, with regards to the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Pipeline. So lots on the table today. Um, before we get started, I just want to apologize. We haven't put out a podcast in a little while. All three of us have been uh, sick with a plague or seeing Hamilton or doing other things that prevented the, us from recording. The colors of things <laughs> coming out of my face were, oh, were stop like right a now. full, <laughs> full. Stop right now. I just had a head cold and it sucked. It's like the full four humors. <laughs> so we are back. We're all healthy. Thanks for your patience. Um, in the meantime, we hope that you have been listening to our friends over at the Canby Report and our friends over at Politicoast. Um, hoping that uh, they keep you updated on the news <laughs> from around Canada and here in Vancouver. Um, anyway, let's get started. Uh, so starting with the, the chill code and exoneration, this was a really interesting and moving um, announcement by uh, Prime Minister Trudeau. So this is a really touching and um, important announcement out of the Trudeau government. Prime Minister Trudeau exonerated the six Chilcotin chiefs who were convicted of murdering 14 white colonists in 18. 18- um, and what happened was uh, five chiefs were called to what they thought were peace talks to end the ongoing Chilcotin War um, between the Chilcotin people and the white settlers there. And instead of going into peace talks, they were suddenly accused of murdering those 14 colonists, tried and convicted and hanged. And the Chilcotin people have maintained that that um, because this was wartime, they could not have been convicted of murdering those, those people that they were um, actually fighting. So so, so all of this has changed now that those chiefs have been exonerated uh, of, of those crimes. And an apology has been issued by the federal government. It's an important step in reconciliation because like, the, the, these are moments that live on in history that echo throughout a, a people's collective memory. And mm. uh, they sour relations between the Chilcotin and the Canadian state to this day, which is because what was done was wrong. And now that we seem to have embarked on a, a pathway towards some reconciliation. Uh, th- these are the kind of things that we need to be talking about and addressing and, you know, examining our history for the things that we have done wrong and figuring out how to make them right. Or if not right, at least say we're sorry. Yeah, and I think I think we're going to have this continuing, as you said, right? This is going to be an ongoing thing. And I think there's a <laughs> habit that comes up whenever we start talking about these things over and over again to say, we've talked about it enough, it's over. And it's I don't think that it can be over. I don't think you can say we've talked about it enough. I think until we've told all of the stories, until we've gone through and, and, and done our best to right all of the wrongs, we can't stop it. And that's why, you know, UBC announced today that UBC came out today and apologized for their part in the residential school program. And UBC, like a lot of post-secondary institutions, uh, at the time were t- took, took an active role in the process. Uh, and I thought it was a really impressive apology. I just want to read out sort of what sa- uh, the, the UBC president, Santa Ono, said. He said, and I think you can, you can replace UBC with Canada here, and it really holds true. He said, if you take pride in being associated with UBC, as I do, then together we must accept the responsibility to acknowledge our predecessor's failure to stop the residential school system, an act that could have reduced, perhaps even prevented, the damage done to generations of Aboriginal children and communities. While we cannot rewrite this history, we must not deny it either. It is our history to own and learn from. And I think that's 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 the language that I think 
is really, really just salient and, and means something to me. And words aren't all that it takes to, right? So, you know, it's, it's important that we apologize for these past wrongs. But UBC has also opened up uh, uh, an Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Center, which is going to serve as a place for people to come forward to tell their stories of what residential school was like for them and t- for people to come forward and learn what residential school was like. And I think that that, as part of that truth and reconciliation, is really key. Yeah, I think so, too. I, I think it's really important for British Columbians and for Canadians to actually learn this history. I don't think a lot of us are, are very aware of things like this. And um, setting up sort of physical spaces where people can come and learn um, more about what went on in creating this country is, is really important um, going forward. And this is not like, I want I want there to be some recognition that this is like part of being a patriot. Like this is part of loving the country is mm-hmm. yes. figuring out mm-hmm. how the country has done bad things in the past and can be improved. Because the, to, to acknowledge this isn't to say that Canada like is irredeemable. Like the, the whole point of saying sorry is that like th- that these past wrongs can be acknowledged and learned from. Our country is is like this very exciting experiment that might you know do some good for the world, but like this involves us like being honest about what we are doing and what we have done. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really like that idea that being a patriot be, means being honest with yourself about the, the truth of your history and where you come from, mm-hmm. not shying away from it. Well, because otherwise you're not really loving your country for what it is. Like right, right. you're just holding some like bizarre abstract view that is way more jingoistic. It's not patriotic. Well, that's, that's, right. that's the difference, I think. And, I, and not to not to not to say we have a, a pure patriotism or anything like that. But I think that's that's the key thing that that uh, that bothers me so much about American patriotism is it's it's so much you need to have a flag on everything. You need to talk about America all the time, and you can't. And it always must be great, right? America must always be great. And I think that that's a toxic form of patriotism. That's a, a forced patriotism. And I think that we have we are a much much more much more mature nation when it comes to our patriotism but we still have you know these huge blind spots around our racial prejudices that we continue to have to this day and have had going back from the start well i think we should move on now to our next topic so we have two new lieutenant governors um in canada in british columbia the uh premier recently appointed janet austin to be to replace judith Guichon, uh who was appointed in 2012 as british columbia's lieutenant governor uh janet austin was the metro vancouver ywca CEO for many years and has been an advocate for um, for women and uh, girls and women's equality for many years. And in Newfoundland, Judy Foote will replace Frank Fagan for, to be first female lieutenant governor in Newfoundland. So if the name Judy <laughs> Foote rings a bell, it uh, shouldn't surprise you. It's She's been actively involved in politics in Newfoundland uh, for a very long time. She's been a political staffer. She's been an MP. She has uh, served as a MHA and a minister in the provincial government for many years. And uh, she recently stepped down as a cabinet minister in the federal government in August to health and family concerns. So um, interesting to see somebody who is so clearly quite political become lieutenant governor. We, I, I think we've kind of moved away from that in recent years in Canada. Have we? Did we? Uh, Judy th- Gishon was like a conservative don't. Like she no. was like involved in the... Was the, she? I didn't know that she was all that involved. She was a rancher. She I knew she was a she rancher. Wasn't a, like her politician. Yeah, she was the head of a. Uh, uh, she was a rancher and the head of the BC Cattlemen's Association and mm. a NGO. Mm-hmm. Type I did not know that one. Yeah, that has. That one's um, new to me. Okay. Yeah. Um, Lois Hall in Alberta wrote a bunch of gardening books, but was also like one of those political celebrities. Lois Hall being uh, an LG in Alberta. Yeah, I mean Iona Campagnola is the example in BC. Uh, but I had thought that we, I had thought as well that we were John Crosby. Right. I think was um, well, very Iona, recently. Uh, uh, so Iona Campagnola was lieutenant governor in BC. Uh, uh, two lieutenant governors ago, I want to say. Um, yeah, before be- um, before Peter po- or Stephen Point before Point Stephen Point Stephen Point. Stephen Point. Yeah, before Stephen Point, uh, and I. Iona Campagnola had famously uh, sort of put the knife in the back of the Turner Turner leadership of the Liberal Party on behalf of Jean Chrétien before Turner was even named leader, as the famed story goes. Uh, and so the, we do have this history of partisan appointments. I just don't think, I think you're right, Aaron, is that we were moving away from it to a certain degree, right? Judy Guichard doesn't have like a, like, she, she it sounds like she was involved in things, but she wasn't like a dyed-in-the-wool partisan, you know? Stephen Point also wasn't. And, you know, the, 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 our, our new lieutenant governor in BC, Austin, is also, again, does 
doesn't come from a par- partisan background. Uh, and I, I find it a, a little uncomfortable to take somebody that was five minutes removed from cabinet uh, and put them in the lieutenant governor's seat. I mean, they have these. Pe- I actually think that these kinds of people are the perfect people to be a lieutenant governor. They are aware of the conventions. They have been steeped. Like you don't you don't stay in politics for as long as someone like Judy Foote does and not absorb the sense of tradition and and parliamentarism that is required of someone who has absolute constitutional authority vested in them for the emergency times think, when the pressure cooker I think you're right up. but but the thing is that the public needs the lieutenant governor to be seen to be not just to be non-biased and non-partisan why because for the no, lieutenant no, no, governor no, 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 the court because, standard here no 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 because for the lieutenant governor's uh, decisions to be viewed as being reasonable or to be as being right uh, they need the public to say that that person is not coming at it with a bias and is well, not that's coming why at they're it they're federal partisan but the thing is that like if the public has a whiff that that person might have a political or a partisan uh, angle to them and an issue comes up like happened last summer in BC like happened in 2008 federally what you're going to have is you're going to have that decision which you know is the kind of thing that is monumental and one time only is going to forever be viewed as toxic and poisoned and you need that lieutenant governor to have that that air of being above the fray that I think frankly I don't think you have if you spent 12 years as a as an M- a member of the House of Assembly in Newfoundland and the cabinet minister in Newfoundland why I, I, I don't I don't agree with this at all. I, I think not to second guess. Actually, no. Actually, to second guess Mikhail Jean's decision in the 2008 parliamentary crisis in which, uh, like, there was a question as to whether her government had confidence or not. There, like, she didn't have the grounding of someone who had spent so many years working in Parliament Hill and had absorbed the conventions. Like, there, these are... Well, no, because you have, you have a bunch of scholars that are going to be there with you. You have a bunch of, pro- like, professors and you have a bunch of legal advisors that have decades and decades of experience telling you what your, your, your legal rights and, and responsibilities are. Yeah, but I, I don't think, like, you haven't you haven't ever indicated to me a time when you thought the LG was too partisan and the public objected. Well, how many times has the LG had to step in provincially in the last 20 years? Um, well, there was, like, last year, which last was, year. Uh, is important. Yep. And, um, and Judy Guichon was seen to not have been on either side of the fence, although there was some, some clamoring that she might have been a liberal shill, but I never really believed any of it, and I don't think the public did either. But, and sh- her actions also show that she... <laughs> Clearly um, demonstrated the that. the NDP to yeah. form government. Well, but we don't have this very often in, BC, in Canada, and so when it does happen, you need it to be seen to be nonpartisan. In my mind, uh, I don't see a very strong value in that. I think that appointing the kind of person who has been appointed to these jobs oh, in past, I don't, I don't like, disagree with you on the on the, the them possibly being better at the job. And, and I'm not, and I'm not actually saying that like it ha- it should be the partisan of the party in government either. Just like the, I, I am talking about appointing the kind of dean of the house type people who. Have been in part mm. like Deepak Obrai would be a great lieutenant governor I, for Alberta. I am just sure. because he's been in Parliament forever and has absorbed like the traditions that are necessary to be. I, I'm like, sure he the would. Be, I'm sure he would be good at the role. But my worry is that there's still that our entire system uh, is predicated around the people believing in the the, the justice and the rightness of the co- of, of the, the, gov- the lieutenant governor, the governor general, and as we saw with King Bing, where Bing where, the King Bing crisis of 19 dickety two. Uh, 26, uh, where, it came, where Bing is by all scholars b- believed to have been right in his decision, and yet like, William Lyon Mackenzie King won the election soundly by saying that, King, that that Bing had robbed him of the gover- uh, of the leadership because he went up against the governor general. Yeah, but that's just King being like a brilliant politician. For me, it's kind of like if the left town and governor is supposed to be the representative of the queen, people would think it was weird if the queen took out um, a Labour Party membership, right? The, the queen yeah. is not supposed supposed to be partisan so it's but, a little odd to see a partisan like somebody who's clearly partisan being uh, her representative Canada. I mean the, the Queen has always been or, or monarchs have always been at, at least in Brit- in the British context uh, like they have their relationships with their prime ministers and they sure like uh, that kind of direct relationship is the same kind of uh, thing that is I think kind of almost transmuted into the person in <laughs> The person in uh, in that role being a bit more or partisan, it's like I, it, there's always been this sort of relationship with the partisan nature of the the crown that is like subsumed under the the velvet and ermine. I, mm-hmm. I, I don't mean to suggest that the, the LG can't behave in uh, in a nonpartisan way, even though they happen to be um, mm-hmm. a party member. I'm just yeah. saying it's it's about <clears throat> optics, right? I, yeah, I definitely agree on that one. I think we have to leave this one there. Um, ready to move on? Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. Oh, well, we do like the theoretical nature of the crown, though. Yes. That, that is one of the... <laughs> <laughs> indeed. Okay, turning now to the Bloc Québécois and their ongoing leadership referendum. So, uh, interesting crisis taking place within the Bloc Québécois party at the moment. Uh, this is, of course, the Separatist Party. The, the Separatist Party in Ottawa, right? In Ottawa. Not the Separatist Party in Quebec, which is the PQ, or yes. Party Québécois. Yes. <laughs> so, in February, 10 uh, Bloc Québécois MPs resigned from caucus over Martine Ouellette's leadership style and political strategy. And they're now going to be holding a referendum which will ask members, A, do you have confidence in uh, in the leader, Martin Ouellette, and B, should the bloc be focused primarily on separatism or should they be focused more broadly on advocating for Quebec's interests at the federal level? So this is really interesting, losing 10 MPs from caucus. Well, isn't her caucus only like 11 MPs? It's pretty small these days. I, th- I think it was something like 80% of the, MP- uh, the MPs in caucus. I think like it was like almost all of the party was. Isn't it? And their their concern is that she's too focused on Quebec independence, which is sort of I thought the point of the Bloc Québécois. It, it was the point, but that's become a real question for both the Parti and the Bloc. Is the people of Quebec seem to, when you poll them, really feel like another referendum is not in the cards, and that they don't want another referendum at all? Uh, I think there was a recently the Parti Québécois, you know, narrowly lost an election to the or lost an election to the Liberals solely because they they, they pledged an immediate referendum. Uh, and the people said, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, whoa! We're mm. we're not happy with that." And so, does the if the bloc keeps agitating for Quebec independence, is that value? Is that something that reflects the will of the people? Yeah, I don't know. What's what's sort of the polls these days on Quebec independence? Is not Quebec good. Still not interested in it uh, anymore. And it skews less and less towards independence the younger and younger you go. Uh-huh. And so, every single year, you have less independent supporters and more non-independent supporters. Is I guess the way to look at it. Mm-hmm. So if that's the direction that people are going, is is the Bloc Québécois going to survive unless they uh, sort of revise their mandate? Well, and that's that's I guess that's been the mandate. I think Lucien Bouchard said uh, in uh, when he formed the Bloc Québécois that the Bloc should only exist for two elections. That he, they should only exist until after the referendum, and then they should all go home. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he said that you know if and that was when he stepped out as Bloc Québécois leader. He said he said you know we can't just stay in Ottawa because we'll be part of the system. And if we're part of the system and we're seen by Quebec to be defending Quebec against the rest of Canada, then Quebecers won't want to leave. Because as long as they say, well, we've got a shield in the bloc in Ottawa, then Quebecers won't want to leave. And I guess that's what's happened. And so now Quebecers don't care about leaving because, you know, they have strong Quebec MPs that will defend their interests. And they have this sort of now enculturated view that they can defend their interests from within Canada. Mm -hmm. Then there's always, like, if people can be a little soft separatist, like, if they're not saying, we have to leave immediately Immediately, uh, and, and rather say maybe independence eventually at some point, uh, which was like kind of the soft position of the NDP in the 2011 election. Uh, sorry, the NPD. The N- the NDP was very NPD, I believe it's yeah, pronounced. Yeah, the N- NDP was very federalist. The, the NPD, uh, perhaps a little less so. The the bloc, you know, does provide that shield. It it, uh, it also you know can eventually form some kind of similar role to the Scottish National Party, which has been a separatist, maybe-ish party in Scotland uh, for, you know, basically since its inception, but it has taken different positions throughout that time. Uh, For a time, it was, you know, known as the Tartan Tories, uh, when the Conservative Party was very unpopular in Scotland, but uh, conservatism needed a vessel there. uh, and, And, you know, certainly that might have happened, that kind of shift towards less social democratic policies that the PQ has been known for may have happened under Pierre Carl Palado. Uh, well, the, 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 PQ, the PQ have been an alliance of people that wanted to leave, whether they were socialist or right or, or conservative. It didn't matter. Same thing in, in most in most revolu- most most independence organizations is they set aside their politics. Right? Look at the Irish Revol- Irish independence where you had straight up Marxists siding with you know staunch liberals and conservatives. Like there is basically a um, a vehicle and a model for the Bloc Québécois slash Parti Québécois to continue to exist. Um, um, as a Quebec advocacy party within the broader Canadian framework. 
while saying maybe independence eventually. Mm-hmm. It's also just really hard when your leader is not in the same parliament as you are. When the leader of the Bloc Québécois is sitting in a different parliament because she sits in the in the, the National Assembly in Quebec rather than the Ottawa legis- the Ottawa Parliament. Although, in fairness, Nicola Sturgeon, uh, who was the the leader in the uh, you know Westminster elections, is an uh, MSP, not an MP. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, it's interesting to think about it. Quebec separatism has been part of Canadian politics for so long, and uh, I'm really curious to see if if things start to change and if the other parties start to get interested in those seats, if they can kind of capitalize on the the um, the loss of interest in separatism in Quebec. Maybe that creates an opening for the NDP. Mm-hmm. Maybe that creates an opening for the Greens. Maybe I, I don't know. Liberals if, or conservatives, yeah, any of them. Liberals or conservatives, sure. Que- Quebec has gone in all different directions in mm-hmm. the last twenty years or so. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, any final thoughts? Nope. All right, moving on. All right, uh, you're listening to Pod Keep Our Land, a program about pol- Canadian politics, parliaments, politicians, and policy. Turning now to our next item, the marijuana bill and the Senate. So this is a very interesting uh, look at the role of the Senate. And um, I thought this story was really, really interesting. So of course, Canada's bicameral system, meaning that we have uh, our legislative branch made up of two bodies, the chambers, we have the House of Commons and the Senate. But unlike in the U.S., Canada the Senate is made up of senators who are appointed by the sitting prime minister. And as a result, the Senate... No, 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 no. Hold on. They are appointed by the governor general on the advice of the prime minister. That is the worst. You're right. That is the worst pedantic clarification. (laughs) (laughs) And JJ, JJ, if you're listening to this... Um, because the prime minister recommends the senators to be appointed, the Senate tends to be made up of patronage appointments, i.e. party members, former MPs, and other business community leaders. Yeah, people who are, are, you know, still much too partisan but to be appointed LG, who may still be very partisan. That's right. That's right. So, um, after a, a bill goes through the House of Commons, it, of course, has to go to the Senate, where it receives sober second thought and study... Uh, by committee, etc. And um, many political science scholars would say is simply uh, a rubber stamp. Um, this case was a little bit different. Um, Justin Trudeau's flagship election promise is, of course, the legalization of cannabis in Canada, and he has set himself a deadline of this July. So there's a bit of a rush on this item. And the bill went through the House no problem, but it nearly failed at second reading when it went to the Senate. Yes. Well, but the interesting thing to me is this independent senators group. Yeah. Is the the, the 44, because we were just talking about how, you know, they're oftentimes former politicians and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And that's not true of 44 of the 105 senators. 44 of the 105 senators have no previous partisan uh, partisan positions that they've held. uh, Because that's the new system of getting senators elected or senators appointed is this this nomination system where you can nominate Mm -hmm. anybody and there's a a process where they get vetted and uh, I believe there's interviews involved and eventually it gets its way up to being a, a, a central, essentially the rubble neighbor of the prime minister at that point. And so we're now in sort of alien ter- or new territory in the Senate where we don't have a majority party holding the Senate. We have 33 sen- uh, conservative senators. 11- 33 conservative senators. <laughs> uh, 11 Senate liberals. 11 Senate liberals. Five non-affiliated, 44, and that 44 independent senators group. And the key thing about independent senators group is that they're not... (laughs) And the weird thing, the the important thing about this independent senators group is that they're not, they don't have traditional bounds of of a party party whip to get them to make sure they come out to the vote, and so on and so forth. And so as soon as the conservatives sort of came together and said that they were going to keep all 33 of their senators in Ottawa to vote down at second reading, all hell was going to break loose, because if it's voted down at second reading, it's dead. Uh, And uh, it meant that all of a sudden, you know, the, the 11 liberals had to bring themselves all back to Ottawa to try to vote. And the independent senators group had to figure out some some response as to what they were going to do about it. Uh, in the end, I think somewhat less than half of the Senate liberals managed to make it to Ottawa. I think six of the 11 didn't even manage to make it back. Um, but the independent senators group were able to, to arrive and have the vote. Right, which is really exciting for the Senate. The Senate doesn't often have this mm-hmm. kind of exciting parliamentary yeah. whirlwind where they're like, oh my goodness, we might not get all the votes that we mm-hmm. need. We're going to have to not exactly whip the members, but if- effectively they had to they had to, to call people up and get them to be there on time. And they had senators flying in the Thursday morning of the vote and the Wednesday night, like late, late at night. People to, were being aroused from their hotel rooms and spirited away to the airport. This and, is you know. exciting stuff. 
stuff. No, it is. You're a parliamentarian. The vote ended up not being particularly close. The vote did end up being 44 to 29, which is not the funny particularly thing, close. The funny thing about parliamentary drama is that it never sounds super exciting when you describe it in retrospect. And, like, and then there was an incredibly close vote on the motion to proceed to debate on Resolution 252 that would have allowed the you know funding recommendations for the but, Ministry of Defense to proceed. And then it's but, like, oh, that's how we went to war. But the thing like, is that, but the thing is that, like, had this vote been killed in second reading, which let's be clear here is uh, the, the the marijuana vote had already been passed in the House of Commons. Uh, it had been a key plank in the the, the 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 Liberals' electoral mandate, and they brought it to the House of Commons, passed the bill, and brought it to the Senate. The Senate has first reading of a bill, which is really literally just reading the bill, and then they have second reading of the bill, which is where they vote to send it to committee to discuss it. And they were going to send it to I think three or four different committees to discuss it, and second reading is very pro forma. Second reading in the Senate especially, is not something that you you vote your conscience on, really. Oftentimes, second readings are a, a unanimous consent vote in the Senate to simply move it to uh, the committee stage. Now, uh, now, Pat and I have had some some difference of opinion on how pro forma the, the second reading vote so is. My but... understanding is the last time the Senate voted down a bill at second reading that, was, that had, had originated in the House of Commons was the uh, environmental bill passed by Jack, Jack Layton and the NDP and the Liberals uh, in 2008, I want to say, uh, in, during the minority years. Uh, this was this is not a, you don't vote down government bills. Yeah, but even, the Senate, like, the, when's the last time the Senate voted down a government bill at all? Even like, the, even the Senate, even the Liberal Senate, with, with the Liberal controlled Senate under Stephen Harper's uh, uh, lower house control, uh, voted through second reading and then amended bills in committee that the government had passed that they disagreed with. But it's fairly unheard of for a government to kill a bill in second reading from the the, well, the, the original. It's even a Senate majority to kill a bill in second reading. Like, yeah, but uh, for the Senate to kill a bill at second reading is essentially unheard of and has really only happened know, once in this century. Like, okay, number one, the century isn't that old yet. and It's almost the, old enough to drink. Number two. And can drink in, in Quebec. Well, n- number two. Sante. Like, the... the uh, <laughs> The uh, like the Senate opposes bills so irregularly that I like I, I question exact like when the Senate gets its hackles up and decides that it wants to oppose a bill I think that in general all the cards are off on the table except in this particular case where because it was a part of the governing party's uh, or the government's election platform there is a Senate convention and like the Senate yeah. runs according to these conventions which is why it's so important that like experienced parliamentarians be appointed to important positions. In in the provinces, uh, that uh, there is like a, uh, it would just be not it's done. In, it's improper. It would be not yeah. done. <laughs> It really speaks to how much the conservatives oppose this notion of legalizing marijuana in Canada. Yeah, it's. Fu- I guess it is really funny. Like, I mean, in our little enclave in Vancouver, it's pretty unlikely to find an opponent to, to, to marijuana. Uh, but it is. It is. It is a, an age line breakdown and a urban, r- urban, a rural urban One of those split. Urban splibs. We got rid of urban ridings uh, in Saskatchewan, Manitoba, finally, and I can forget that word now. Um, but we are like urban rural split and an age split, and so it's it's something that, you know. I guess because I don't see it very often. And it is something that does still exist. It's very, very strong and adamant opposition to the legalization of marijuana. Yeah, li- literally, like once you get up through the Rockies, it like f- opposition starts to harden. Yeah, because even in the interior, uh, even, pa- past- even, even in Point Grey, or in you know, I'm sure in, you know, senior homes. Yeah, if you look if you look on the map of of you know dispensary locations in Vancouver, there are some notable gaps. <laughs> Terrasdale. <laughs> um, but the bill went through. And so and the bill went through 44 to 29 uh, with 28 conservative senators as well as one uh, one Mike Duffy voting against uh, voting against the bill. Ooh. And 43, uh, uh, 43 independent senators as well as liberal senators and non-affiliated senators and one speaker of the uh, of the Senate. Mm, uh, the right. speaker of the Senate actually uh, came forward to vote for the bill. Uh, and and I, I haven't seen his reasoning but I can only imagine it was to reinforce the, the, the sort of the, the the, the 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 spirit of the Senate moving forward uh, government business that was in government electoral mandates. But that's unusual as well yes. for a speaker to to vote. Yes, particularly when he doesn't have to, because he only have to vote when it's a making or breaking a tie. Right. Either that, or he just really, really likes wants to get high. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess that could that also be the case. <laughs> He actually thought he was turned to puff puff pass. I don't know. He was getting up to the upper to grab the <laughs> the upper chamber is higher than the lower house for a reason. Oh, this is getting bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I keep having trying to formulate a joke around a sober second thought, um, but I haven't come up with anything. <laughs> <laughs> the, the classic toker second thought. Uh, it's you know. um, So, what do you think this means for the notion of an independent Senate? An independent Senate is an illusion. <laughs> well, I think you have to have a constitutional amendment to actually do it, and everything else is no, a farce. No, I think it's clear that the, the, the it seems to be all indications are the independent senators group, which has formed its own coalition, uh, are a non. Nonpartisan group, a nonpartisan be, party. Yeah, I mean, it's, we're we're certainly not strangers to that in Vancouver, uh, but I think it's you do have it does seem to be working. Uh, the system does seem to be working, and as, is it? Is it? And no, I think it's not. As each year goes on, uh, what you're going to see is you're going to see less uh, conservative and liberal senators and more senators that are styling themselves independent in the model of like the Yukon legislature, where they don't have political parties. Yes, but there is a problem. Like the government has been unable to stick handle its legislation through the Senate. Yeah, the government has been talk- incapable of stick handling its legislation through the House. It sort of depends on what you think success means well, in terms of a, of a legislature. Do you want to pass all your bills very easily and cleanly, or do you want to have actual debate and discussion it, in your yeah. houses and, of representation? And the, 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 the liberal government has been uniformly bad at legislation in general. The, the, the liberal government has been bad at moving legislation through the House, where they have an absolute majority and can do whatever they want to a large degree. And so, yeah, they're having difficulty moving things through the Senate in a timely manner. But is that a problem with these new independent senators, or is that a problem endemic to this government being a government made up of relative political neophytes who are learning the ropes as they go. I think that's what happens when you take a party from third place that hasn't been in power for 10 years and put them in first place. I mean, yes and yes, but like the people who have been introducing government bills in the Senate, like the Senate has not worked its way around the new paradigm quite yet. No, and that's, uh, I think, I think that's fair to say. Yeah, because like, you know, the the one conservative senator who had the gall to introduce a government bill that he agreed with in the Senate has been shunned from the caucus. Uh, well, is, oh, and, and is like, so like then, a bunch of mean girls all dressed in. So then, so then, on, then is on, this is this is this second second on second both days second we reading wear blue Patrick? They do. Uh, so is this second reading? Uh, they actually do. Is this second reading th- problem uh, that happened here a problem of this, the new Senate dynamic, or is it a problem of the the type of senators that Stephen Harper was appointing? Yes, because and yes. Stephen because... Harper was appointing some of the most uh, like partisan uh, people he could find. Whereas you and you know the previous prime ministers, they did that too. But they would also appoint you know uh, the 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 Romeo Dallaire's and so on and so forth that would, were good voices to have in the Senate. They would also appoint people that were you know while career partisans were career partisans that understood the nature of the job. Larry like Campbell. You say. Larry Campbell was a Larry Campbell was a, by being yeah. partisan in every different way in Vancouver yeah. and then moving to the red chamber. So so I don't think any of us. So I, I don't think that I don't think that the new yes he was the the chief coroner for the city he did examine the dead. That is an accurate statement. But anyways, I don't think that the new uh, layout, I don't think the new structure, which is not a a Senate reform that I would have done, but it seems, I think it seems to be working in a manner that is improving governance. Okay, any final thoughts? Well, we seem to be all in agreement on the problems and not in agreement as to whether anything is working right, so... Nothing has changed from everywhere. Yep, great. Great. All right. well, this bill is (laughs) non... Excuse me? No, go ahead. Great. So this bill has gone to committee um, and we will see what happens at third reading stay tuned for more exciting senate parliamentary excitement time to move on pod keep our land let's talk about energy politics it's what everybody seems to be talking about these days i don't interestingly my voice is not a bass guitar I was going to say boombox. Okay, let's talk about energy politics. Premier John Horgan recently announced he is offering new tax breaks to the LNG industry to entice them to come and uh, put together some projects, specifically in Kitimat. And the tax breaks are um, looking to be worth up to $6 billion in foregone government revenue over 40 years. Assuming that an LNG plant gets built. Assuming that the plant gets built. The whole point of these tax breaks is to attract the investment from um, private enterprise to to extract this LNG and, and ship it through Kitimat. Which it should be noted, uh, would each of those individual projects would be the largest or second largest or third largest individual chunk of private money that would be coming to BC ever. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, the projects 
uh, are estimated to amount to about $40 billion worth of investment. So Mm -hmm. pretty considerable. And if you remember the 2013 election, this was what Christy Clark ran on. And if you recall her, um, her election platform, Debt Free BC, I think this was this Mm -hmm. was sort of the the cornerstone of that whole notion that we would bring in uh, so much money that we could pay off all of the provincial debt in one go. So Premier John Horgan is kind of continuing on that legacy and trying to make it happen. But he's actually reduced uh, the amount of money that um, the, the provincial government would actually um, make off of this deal in, in order to sort of sweeten the pot for um, for potential investors. The challenge is that it makes it very difficult for him to maintain his alliance with the, the Greens, who are propping up his government. The Greens, of course, are very interested in, um, in climate action. And uh, we do have a target here in British Columbia to reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, to 40% below 2000 levels by the year 2030, which is coming up. Now, th- this would be <coughs> fascinating. Like, for, from a purely political lens, this might be brilliant uh, for John Horgan trying to outflank the Liberals on the pro-development side of resource development while somehow engineering a defeat for his party from the Greens, uh, which would transport him into an election that he would, I think, at the moment, win a majority in. So, yeah, um, I, I think I think it's also trying to avoid the the, the build nothing mantra the, the, that I think he risks uh, that he risked with Site C and stuff like that. And I again, like as with Site C, I don't really support the idea of tax cuts to major polluters. Um, but I think there's a conversation to be had around LNG, I guess, and its ability to offset Chinese consumption of coal. It's a transition fuel. Yeah, that, that phrase that I don't really agree with. Um, and it also uh, LNG apparently uh, also can be converted to liquefied natural gas uh, far, at a far lower carbon intensity in BC mm-hmm. than in places like Australia because we're doing it in cold cold areas. Uh, so there are like some benefits where our LNG industry will by nature be more less less climate destructive than other LNG industries in the world, which again, in my mind, doesn't sell it to me. Um, but yeah, we have giant tax breaks for companies to destroy the plant. You don't have to, we're, we're the ones selling it. It doesn't, doesn't have to be sold to you. You're selling it. That's like, for BC. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Andrew Weaver did come out and say that he had lost confidence in the House. And when asked if he would seek a confidence vote, he said no. Right. Yeah, it's, it seems like Andrew Weaver is really pushing for this carbon, carbon reduction plan for yeah. the fall. And well, and he knows he can't take the government down. There won't be another vote of confidence until the spring. That's not how they, you just don't have them mm-hmm. outside of the budget and the throne speech. Typically, we only have two in BC. Uh, and then he also needs the this fall's referendum on electoral reform. And so he won't, I think, damage, do anything to take down this government until that, that mm-hmm. referendum has either passed or failed. Mm-hmm. And Nor it, really can he. Also true. It's a bit of an about face for Premier Horgan, who, um, when he was in opposition, was against this LNG plan and against uh, tax breaks. Yeah. Well, clearly, because they were just not strong enough. I, I fully support Minister Mungel and John Horgan <laughs> for uh, their truly visionary leadership on this file. <laughs> Well, it is funny, too, because the B.C. Liberals can't really do much other than say that the, the, the NDP are stealing their ideas. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> meanwhile, the Greens get to get meanwhile, the Greens get to get to, to grandstand and be very angry. Uh, and the NDP gets to look like they're, the they're, NDP, they're seeking business. I the, feel like it's the B.C. Liberals don't get to uh, talk about stealing ideas because of the clone speech. Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that one. Uh, but it's, 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 it's unless it's, stealing ideas is. Yeah. Idea stolen but from think, the BC Liberals. I think we're now in a place where LNG is a weird political football to have, um, and I don't even know if any plants will even emerge. So until one does, it's a real question. You can give all the tax breaks you want to non-existent entities. I can break. I can give a whole pile of tax breaks to the. Uh, banana industry of British Columbia, the banana producing industry of British Columbia, but, you know... Okay, give your minister a little more credit. Uh, like, If we don't attract any banana plantations, then we're not going to lose any money. Yeah, but I, I think that there is, like, these things don't emerge out of a vacuum. John Horgan doesn't go up and say, I'm going to take this massive political hit on my green credentials for no reason. Fair point. Uh, yeah, fair point. Michelle Mongel has been talking to people. Yeah. I'm sure there is something in the pipeline or compressor. Oh. Speaking of <laughs> speaking of that was that was that was cleverly done. <laughs> speaking of pipelines, 
Let's turn now to our ongoing, um, I don't know what you would call it, dispute with, uh, with BC's ongoing dispute with the province of Alberta. over And the, Canada. And, and the, the nation, the Dominion of Canada. By the way, Eastern Canada, the West exists. <laughs> over the, uh, the twinning of the Trans Mountain Pipeline um, by Kinder Morgan, which is a pipeline that would run from Alberta to Burnaby, British Columbia, uh, where uh, the petroleum product would then be loaded onto ships and um, shipped off to Canada. So this has been ongoing for a long, long time. Um, The federal government has issued an environmental assessment permit, says, go ahead, build the pipeline. Alberta's like, yes, we're going to get to build our pipeline and get our stuff to market. Province of British Columbia, the city of Burnaby are very much opposed and have promised to do everything they can to block it from, from taking place. And their tactic thus far has been delay, bureaucracy, denying, you know, different kinds of building permits. Permits. Something that has has come to I, I think I think we can fairly call them nuisance lawsuits at this point. But also, like, but also they keep losing. Uh, like yes, Kinder that, that's why they're a nuisance. They're not an Morgan, actual keep, thing. Kinder Morgan keeps winning those, the, and nothing has slowed down about Kinder Morgan's building of the pipeline at this point. Is this is what I find fascinating. Um, so, so Premier Notley in Alberta um, tried one interesting tactic where she uh, uh, denied um, the ex. Sorry, she stopped the purchase of a wine. BC wine of BC wine uh, to Alberta, but that uh, she she took it back, didn't she? Yeah. So the wine wars are over. Uh, we're no well, longer no, 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 the first wine war is over. The first wine war is over. There's always a second. She's threatening a second now. Well, but yeah. it's gotten worse. So yesterday, uh, Kinder Morgan announced that if uh, BC didn't discontinue its opposition to the pipeline by Mar- by May 31st that they were going to essentially terminate the pipeline deal. And they were already be- beginning to cancel or, or put on hold uh, a lot of development of the pipeline. And they stopped non-essential spending. Non-essential spending. That was the yeah. word for it. Uh, and so immediately afterwards, everybody had to get, a, everybody had to pull the little flags out and have a press conference. You know, uh, Jim Carr, the minister in charge federally, uh, went over to the, they, they stood in front of the Peace Tower and gave his, Rachel Notley from the legislature gave her press conference and John Horgan gave his press conference, and they all yelled at each other. Essentially, didn't John Horgan issue a quiet statement? Like, did, wasn't his John Horgan one? did a press conference? Oh, okay. which, I thought his, which I thought one journalist, which one journalist I saw said that he was studiously avoided uh, any form of brag, bragging. <laughs> So, so right. Kinder Morgan has sort of um, given us an ultimatum here. They, they're saying if 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 these sort of roadblocks aren't out of the way by May thirty first, we're out. Um, which is a big problem for Premier Notley, who's about to face a provincial election herself, and she's being yep. attacked um, by Jason Kenney on the right. Mm. And uh, and and uh, she really has to prove that she can bring these jobs and this investment to her province in order to to win the next election. So, and, and I think Justin Trudeau too, who is also facing an election in a year's time. Right. Right. Yeah, uh, and he's also said that this project is. He's said that this project is in the national interest and will be built. Uh, and if it doesn't get built, that's you know one more. Now they haven't issued any kind of instrument declaring it oh, no, a no. project in the national interest. Absolutely, there are two different things the federal government can do. They can say something's in the nation, national interest, and mm-hmm. they can actually invoke the laws that declare it in the national interest. And they have so far done not done the second one. So what kind of laws do you mean? Uh, essentially, they would be, be able to stop uh, the, the the province of British Columbia from intervening in any further legal matters as pertains to the, the, the pipeline. And so, like, I, I can imagine it taking several different forms. Uh, it could be something like a piece of enabling legislation, like the Kinder Morgan Pipelines Enabling Act, or um, or the uh, there could be some kind of order in council that declare it in the major national interest that would be directed to the ministries of natural resources and justice to oppose uh, all actions by the BC government uh, and, you know, seek interested party status in the courts in those lawsuits and ask for summary judgments against them. There's, there's also the rumor uh, that the federal government is considering cutting equalization payments to British Columbia, which would be yeah. a real nuclear button. Uh, yeah. Wait, BC gets equalization payments? I, I think... Uh, yes, all provinces get equalization payments. Some get more than others. They're all uh, Transfer payments, I guess, would be more. Bulk transfer uh, payments. Oh, okay. Transfer. Tra- yeah. okay Sorry, the transfer it. payments is what yeah. I meant to say. So uh, Keith Baldry is reporting that uh, just... And he's not saying that it's necessarily happening. He doesn't necessarily 
have a source, but as a, as a, as a concept, a 5% cut in federal transfer payments uh, would result in a $200 million deficit for the uh, BC NDP. And so that would be quite the cudgel that the federal government could land. Although nowhere near the nuclear button that Rachel Notley is threatening. Which is? So Rachel Notley is threatening to do exactly what they threatened to do in the 70s, the last time the federal government got involved in, in, in Alberta oil, which is to let the, this time, Western bastards freeze in the dark. Uh, they uh, have now, they will now be introducing a bill in the legislature, uh, I believe tomorrow or in, soon, uh, that will actually restrict the flow of uh, oil and gas to be sold in BC markets. The idea is to try to starve us out. Which, by the way, will start to kill people within a week. Like, well, I mean, we'll see what the, we'll see how much it cuts. We'll see whether or not additional, like, no, no, but like, additional supply sorry, is provided I, by other markets. We have no, but, we have, no, no, like, we have like, no idea sorry, what the but, but like to, to to be clear, when I when I say that, I mean like if if the taps are turned off entirely, like that's where BC gets its oil, and we need the oil to we live. Also, we also have no idea how long the the, the, the stockpiles are. We have no, like what, how long like they just no we're not out. stockpiles. Not like we're saving. We don't but. we don't have a stockpile. We figured this out recently because the refinery just went down for maintenance, and we were out of gas. Yeah, but the interior in the north will have their own supplies that exist for purposes of commercial production. We have you know Cherry Point in the United I, States. Well, it, 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 but, but refineries exist in the north. We don't, we've been debating. The, no, no, the I'm not saying that there are refineries there. I'm saying that there's water. barrels of oil yeah. up there. Or there's barrels of there's gasoline up there. There is stuff that exists in the various tanks, and we don't know how long it will last. Yeah, but like the, I'm just trying, so have, just trying to reinforce that, that like no, this is a big thing that she is threatening. Might be a big thing. I have no idea, and you have no idea because we don't know. Well, no, but the whole point like, of time you're probably is, right that it is a big thing, but I, we don't know how how the markets will respond. We have no idea what supply can be brought in from Washington State or offshore, whether or not, what this actual effect will have. Do you think it will have the effect of threatening Premier Horgan? Do you think he's going to be frightened by that threat? Well, I think her the, the intent that the Alberta NDP has is to drive up the price. I don't think that... I haven't seen any estimates that, that, that sort of purport to what Matthew is saying here, that there will create shortages. Um, but what has been uh, ascribed is a, a price jump, a, a mass, a significant mm-hmm significant price spike. Yeah. Uh, and so they're talking like 40 cents to a dollar increases in gas per liter and stuff like that. And if there's one thing that really riles up people in British Columbia and everywhere, it's the price of gas or it's the price of natural gas or it's the price of your your whatever whatever you're paying for that like the, the, you do the, po- with. the point of any such policy like this is to inflict pain on the people of BC. The consumer, yeah. Uh, in order for them to get, you know, pressure on the government to step away from their legal brinksmanship with respect to the pipeline. Yep. Um, and, it, like, it's it's a high risk and, and very substantial, uh, like, a huge lever, cost to, to Alberta, too. Lever that is being pulled, yeah, because, of course, this will like, escalate. It, it has the potential to escalate the trade war. Um, well, also, but, just like, cost that, money to Alberta, because they yes. will, won't, they'll, they'll be foregoing the money they would be making in taxes and royalties and wages and everything. But, like, th- this type of thing, uh, like, I, I just wanted to explain what the, the tactic we're trying to do. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm fair. Yeah. I, I think the, the risk there is if if the province of Alberta tries to do something like that, like something that will really hurt people, they, they start to lose their um, their credibility as being in the interest of all Canadians. Yeah, but they I think... They start to look petty I think, and mean. I think Albertans have a proud history of wanting to turn the taps off for the rest of Canada. They had bumper stickers that said, let the eastern bastards freeze in the dark. Sure, sure. But yeah. I mean, this, this is in part a, a legal battle, but it's also oh, a yeah. battle of public opinion. Which could hurt Trudeau, I guess, yeah. Right, yeah. Well, like, what That's I think point. what I think the optimal outcome for Notley is for A, Horgan to back down, and B, Justin Trudeau to issue some kind of instrument, like something with a seal and a stamp and a signature on it that says, this is in the national interest. Jim Carr's tweets are not enough. Yeah. So, uh, but she she's hoping that her threats can be more of a, a fleet in being rather than actually engaging combat. Mm-hmm. She's also got another thing that she's offered, and she said that the province of Alberta will be a direct investor in the pipeline, which, you know, as a, as a good social democrat lefty, I generally support nationalizing industries. I'm not so sure I support nationalizing oil and gas industries uh, and further expanding them, but that's a decision she's decided to go down, which is the, the fear that Kinder Morgan, the Kinder Morgan is saying that there's investor flight, that investors won't invest in the pipeline because there's fears it won't get built. 
failed. And uh, Rachel Notley says, have no fear. We'll give you all the money you want. Here's the bank account. Uh, and I think that that's really clearly what Kinder Morgan is angling for here is they are angling for more money. And they are, they are taking uh, the, the, probably the government of Canada and definitely the government of Alberta for a walk. Okay. Yeah, is and the, the UCP is on board. The United Conservative Party of Alberta under leader Jason Kenney uh, appears to uh, like be kind of uh, murmuring you, about falling he, in line behind the, the invest in the pipeline. Yep, it's 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 stunning to watch just how much Rachel Notley has to fear from the, 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 the conservatives who all they want to do is hand out government handouts to oil and gas, uh, you know, like a good fiscally conservative government would do. It's really, it, it comes down to who has, who bears the risk and who bears the benefit, right? And, and that's where we seem to be at an impasse. The province of British Columbia holds all the risk and the province of Alberta holds a lot of the benefit, even though they claim that it's to the benefit of all Canadians. Um, I, what I don't hear coming out of this debate is an offer of more of the benefit going to BC coastal communities. And, mm-hmm. and why do you think that's not happening? Sort of a, a, a discussion about, can we sweeten the deal for BC to make it to make the risk more acceptable? Well, the federal government has uh, made several promises and it started to follow through on some increases to to risk mitigation and and spill cleanup in the Salish Sea. Um, nothing that would be nothing. There is absolutely no amount of preparation that you can have to a, a major spill, like nothing. But you know, the minor spills happen really frequently with sure. a, with a thing like this, and so you know that kind of a mitigation. Sure, uh, there is research going into what bitumen does in, when it hits water. And we still don't know what it would do in the Salish Sea, uh, and so there are there are some of that. But yeah, I think you're right. There isn't a lot of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, like it, it's hard. It, it's hard to both hold hold your hand out and a sword at the same time. Uh, Rachel Notley's doing it. She's she's holding her hand out with wads of cash for Kinder Morgan, and she's waving a sword at John Morgan. Yeah, yeah, yeah but she she's not she's not asking for money. Like that would be what John, John Morgan's position has to be, because his oh, rhetorical so position should... his rhetorical position is locked in by the agreement of alliance and permanent friendship with the... the and, and and he truly does believe... He truly does seem supplier. to be... He truly does believe in the dangers of bitumen in the Salish Sea. He's got a jar of bitumen on his desk. Yeah, that's such a game. And he's had one for water. years. Photo up. I don't. I don't know. I think. I don't think so. Anyways, but you think he's hamstrung by his alliance with the, the Greens? Yeah, I, I think that like if you, there are things that he agreed to in writing, and then there's like LNG type stuff which he did not put in the confidence and supply agreement. Uh, and John Morgan has been a man of his word, and he is stuck in this rhetorical position, and so we can't be asking for stuff because that would be tacitly acquiescing to the idea of the pipeline getting built. Well, that's probably true in there. So I guess what you're saying is he needs to take a lesson from every Newfoundland and Labrador and Premier uh, over the last 50 years who consistently screamed and yelled at Ottawa while also demanding more money. Yeah, but you have to be really careful not to stick your Judy foot in your mouth. Oh, wow. (laughs) How did you get that one so fast? Well, I'm sure this is not the last we are going to hear about Trans Mountain and uh, the Kinder Morgan pipeline. Any final thoughts for today? Nope, I'm all out of thoughts. <laughs> all out of thoughts. I think, out. I think this is going to get more and more out of control. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, I, just the sheer amount of bombast that came out of the last 48 hours, I can't wait to see where this... Oh, I mean, I, I not can't wait, but this, I, this is going to get weird. Yeah, you know, we didn't even mention um, uh, leader of the federal Greens, Elizabeth May, being arrested on Burnaby Mountain during the protests. Uh, or saying today that she really strongly believes that we should refine our oil here and not ship it away. Uh-huh, yeah. yeah. Which, interesting Green Party position. <laughs> well... Oh, <laughs> um, yes, her and Kennedy Stewart were both arrested, mm-hmm. uh, and a BC court judge... I don't know if he has the authority to is suggesting that they should be charged criminally and not civilly. Well, you don't really get, yeah, that's too into the weeds. All right. <laughs> All right. Let's leave it there. Uh, we can't talk about politics forever. What else are you guys thinking about this week? I've had some very expansive thoughts. Expanse <laughs> is back. The coolest Canadian made show. I don't understand why all What's... future government institutions look like 1970s Canadian universities, but uh, <laughs> um, suffice it to say, it's a great show. The greatest show on the Sci Fi Network today is coming back on Wednesday. 
I am so excited to see my favorite conflicted Captain Martian Marine, and from the weird, weird world of advertising, my favorite hey, UN official, Kristen Harris Okay, the Expanse. What about you, Patrick? Uh, I'm gonna use I'm gonna use two this time. I'm gonna take up more time. Uh, I'm gonna say that last week, uh, Aaron and I went down to Portland and saw Hamilton, which we paid way more money for than I'm comfortable with. Um, but it was everything that I could have possibly dreamed it to be. It is the most Amer- uh, most important musical in American history, and it, it's so amazing. And then the second. What I'm going to say is I'm utterly devastated that Henrik and Daniel Sedin have retired. Uh, it is 17 seasons of, of amazing hockey on the part of two of the greatest and most uh, most gentlemanly and class acts, classy uh, players to ever play the game. They're yeah, it's it's uh, Vancouver is the worse off to not have them next year. I mean, they're still living here. They're yes, never, they're never leaving. Um, yeah, we but get but keep- I will say <laughs> I, 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 I will I will I assume they listen to our podcast, so I'll say thank you, Daniel and Henrik, uh, for all those years and. And also, thank you for that last game, because it couldn't have been a better game. I was screaming and yelling like it was 2011 all over again. Well, I think that Hairspray is the greatest American musical, but we'll leave that debate for another day. Okay, I can see the argument. (laughs) I'm not, no, I'm not, I'm not. (laughs) I mean, I don't agree with it, but I can see the argument. There's going to be... You get if you start to engage with me on this, it's just going to be all, of, all all over the place. We should have a Mount Rush cast on the greatest American <laughs> musical. <laughs> we should have a Mount Rush cast again at some point. <laughs> all right. So what are you what are you oh, thinking about? I okay. So I recently discovered a new mystery series. Um, about a, a detective called Lane um, Winslow, and it takes place in Nelson, B.C., shortly after World War II, and it's about a woman who was in the British intelligence during World War II, moves to Nelson, B.C. to recover from her shell shock, and then she becomes a detective, and she's using her, like... That sounds like, fascinating. It's it, so great. And it's, it's a like, book series? It's a book series, okay. and, and it's, like, got all this, like, B.C. history, and they're talking about the Dukabors, and, like, Amazing. the Japanese internment is so good. And they're really well written, so and it's it's called it. um, the the uh, the first book is called Killer in King's Cove. Highly recommend. And, and who's it by? Oh, they're they're by Iona I, Wishaw. Oh, neat. So highly recommend. That's a neat looking book. And you can own a Wishaw too. <laughs> I, we I didn't get know. that one. I own a Wishaw, and you can own a Wishaw. Oh, no, no. Okay, that's all we have for you tonight. Thank you so much for listening to Pod Keep Our Land. I'm Aaron Rennie. I'm Matthew Naylor. And I'm Patrick Meehan. Please, if you like this episode, post it on Facebook or Twitter. Share it with your friends. We are always um, looking for feedback on how we record, so, so please do let us know what you think of the show. We are on Twitter. We are on Facebook. Um, please subscribe uh, wherever you get your podcasts. Ooh, reviews. We'd like reviews. Yeah. Five-star reviews, please. A review would be great. Uh, once again, thanks so much for listening, and we'll talk to you next time on Podkeeper Land.